Hello and welcome to Aspiring Leadership, Making the Move into Leadership. Each week, we'll be chatting with various leaders from all different walks of life, learning from their experiences and sharing their advice. It's the perfect podcast for somebody wishing to step into a new leadership role or for a leader who's already there wishing to continue their development. If you'd like, share and subscribe to the podcast. Happy Thursday, everybody. And as always, you're really welcome along to this week's episode of Aspiring Leadership, making the move into leadership. I think we're up to our 22nd or 23rd episode. I'd have to double check that. I should have checked it before I began, but not to worry. Um, <laughs> really enjoying the hot weather in Ireland. It's it's absolutely phenomenal. It's it's like being in Spain for a week. It's so, it's so great to be able to go out and enjoy the back garden, go for walks and not have that constant thought of will it rain or won't it rain so you're able to plan a little bit as well around what you can do outdoors so honestly it's been very enjoyable for everybody and um i hope i hope everyone is enjoying it as much as i am although i'm not great and getting much of a tan but uh i'm enjoying it all the same so uh as always thanks a million to last week's guest and all of the listeners who have who listened to the show a uh, huge response from right around the globe as always uh interestingly enough the viewers isn't as strong on youtube but audio downloads are still extremely strong and hundreds of people downloading each episode so that's fantastic and again as i've seen all every week look it's testament to the guests and angie had a brilliant story last week uh how she's overcome her challenges with alcoholism and has taken learnings from that um to be able to help her in relation to her career and her leadership and anyone who hasn't listened to last week's podcast it's well worth coming back to have a listen to angie and her story because it's um it's one that we can all take so many learnings from and uh, another great guest coming up uh this week we have noel and noel uh, is a recruitment specialist and he particularly focuses on hiring people from eastern europe and bringing them into uh, roles around europe because of their work ethic but he is a tremendous amount of experience from a leadership sense worked in the it industry and now he's he owns his own organization so he's taken fantastic experience from all of those and he shares some great tips with us we, we talk about that in a moment but before i get to that uh as always let me throw out this week's coaching question so I um I'm lucky enough I probably mentioned it before to take part in a coaching supervision group with Professor David Clutterbuck who's an absolute genius when it comes to all things coaching organization culture leadership etc and in the session yesterday one of the I was speaking about a particular topic uh, the transition of being a coach to being a manager and some of the challenges that I face in relation to that took some phenomenal learnings from it but one of the other participants observed that I tend to talk talk what I think so I kind of while I'm thinking I'm talking it out and there's advantages to that of course but there's disadvantages to it as well and perhaps from time to time I think I talk too much because I, I talk out what I'm thinking rather than thinking about it and making a decision as opposed as opposed to whether it's the right time to talk it or should I think about it first and then talk about it? So my question is, coming from that, when do you talk too much? Or if you want to put a different phrase in it, when are you talking what you're thinking? And of course, there's benefits, as I said, and, and from time to time, it's brilliant to, to, to bounce ideas off people. Um, but then there's other times where perhaps you're just talking for the sake of talking and spending even three seconds before talking to think what am I actually being asked here and what's the purpose of me talking so um it was it was great to get that learning from somebody who I don't know who picked it out and um definitely definitely something I can I can work on going forward so maybe some of you you can do that too so there, there's the question again so when you either a when you're talking too much or b when are you talking out your thoughts and what could you do about that? What what little pause could you put in there or how could you 
what practical action could you take? Maybe again, it's journaling because something that I'm not doing as much of as I'd like, and I find it very beneficial in relation to that. All right, good stuff. So over to Noel Andrews now for our chat. A couple of things we talk about, as I mentioned, are uh, remote leadership, emotional intelligence, learning, recruitment, interviewing from both sides of the table, how he built his own businesses and how we how we move from being part of large organizations to taking that risk like so many of the other guests and going out on his own um initially and, and the bridge that he built for himself there which is quite interesting and some of you might take some great learnings from it so without me giving away too much of the chat because noel tells it a lot better than i do i'll uh, pass you over to himself so three two one hey uh how's things noel and thanks a million for popping along to this week's podcast uh so we'll get straight into it uh maybe you'd give us a little bit of an introduction into well your background initially and who you are and what you're doing right now hey Connell, it's great to be here yeah sure no worries so a uh, bit of a split background uh, i was uh, studied aerospace systems engineering many moons ago at university uh, went into it in the airline industry and worked my way up into kind of director level roles uh, within kind of corporate it um, so in kind of travel hospitality and, and gaming um, moved into kind of the interim world and kind of contracting and so kind of taking uh, you know kind of senior management roles again transformation director operations director type roles typically kind of building and leading pretty large teams um and then on the side i've always been pretty entrepreneurial and uh kind of like never more so than about three and three years ago kind of bought an online business called job rack uh, which is where we help online business owners hire really really great remote workers from eastern europe okay very good uh you hugely diverse background there and all tell me where, where is that entrepreneurial streak come from it's a good question. It, it was there from an early age. I mean, my mum was always pretty entrepreneurial. Uh, she had a few kind of different businesses when I was growing up. And um, yeah, it just built from there. And, you know, never more so than kind of picked up kind of Tim Ferriss four hour work week, uh, probably about kind of eight, nine years ago. And just some of the kind of the themes from that just really hit home and uh, kind of just went from there. I think I've also been entrepreneurial, not just in you know pursuing my own business, but also my approach to kind of corporate life as well. Um, taking a, you know, excuse the phrase, but, you know, I'll say I'll, I'll be polite, kind of get stuff done um, type approach to it. And, you know, I had a, a very rapid progression um, through my kind of uh, 15 or so years in the corporate world. And a lot of that was taking that kind of almost entrepreneurial spirit to to a kind of a less entrepreneurial world. Could you give me an example of that, actually, because it is something that tends to get lost in big corporates because people mm. often join the corporate for, for that, uh, for the opposite reason, you know, the safety, the guaranteed mm. wage, etc. And, and sometimes you might lose a little bit of that startup nature. Yeah, so I, I think for me, I've always just got stuck in and done things. So, you know, my very first role was working for a low cost airline. Uh, I was looking after kind of projects in the kind of the engineering side. Um, and, you know, we, as an example, we were, you know, implementing barcoding and stock management into a massive, you know, you know thousands and thousands of line items of spares. Um, and as part of implementing it, you know, someone needed to stick barcodes on about 4,000 sticky bins. Well, you know, it wasn't my job, but it got the project done. So, you know, a couple of evenings, a couple of weekends and 4,000 bins got sticky labels on it. And so some, that's kind of my approach that it's just like, look, a job needs done. Let's just get it done because it, you know, it gets things going and that's kind of progressed. And thankfully I've not had to do too many, you know, sticky labels <laughs> since then. Um, but that's just the kind of approach. Just let's just get shit done and let's just make it happen. And that, you know, is in the, you know, not many people take that approach. And when you do, it gets noticed and you get opportunity, you get great self-satisfaction because you made things happen. Um, and it then typically kind of turns into kind of progression opportunities because, you know, nine times out of 10 or the other 90, 99 people won't do it. So if you're the one that does, you know, people kind of see you as a can do kind of person, someone that's making a difference. And then you get given opportunity and, you know, you get kind of uh, thrown into some deep, deep ends of the pool, as it were. But, you know, sink or swim and, you know, you try hard enough, you sink, uh, you swim, sorry. And, um, you know, kind of life builds up from there. Very good. You mentioned the Tim Ferriss book. I think you're probably the fourth guest I've had on out of 20 mm. that, that have mentioned it. I'm going to ask a crude enough question. How did you have the balls to actually go and execute what you're reading in the book? Because I read it too and I was like, ah, that sounds great, but I, I, I think I'll leave that. <laughs> yeah, so I, uh, if you've been in the kind of corporate world, especially in IT, the gentle first step is to go into the interim world and go contracting. 
right? So especially in the UK, contracting is a very, very, very healthy market. Um, there's lots of good opportunity and it's still pretty safe. It's lucrative. You know, the day rates are good. Um, and if you're good at what you do uh, and you've got kind of confidence and, you know, just a, a healthy touch of arrogance about it and, you know, just turn it into confidence, that's the, the kind of gentle way in that kind of takes you into, you can kind of put a bit of money aside um, and then look for that opportunity to spend, you know, to kind of spend the money and spend the time focusing on. Uh, that's, that's the kind of gentle route. And ultimately just a knowledge that, you know, for me at least the days of working in the same job or the same company for 30, 40 years are, you know, for most people that is dead. Um, that doesn't kind of, it's not really a thing. And just the thing that I wanted was, was hugely important enough to me to, to warrant the risk and um, just getting jumped into it. Yeah, very good. But you did it incrementally. And obviously you had the awareness of being in the tech world that the, the contractor route was the way to go down and build from there. Yeah, absolutely. And still, you know, I still do some consulting even today um, because I enjoy it because it's completely different scale working with, you know, kind of large corporate businesses with, you know, turnover of a billion pounds a year. Um, and then on the flip side, working with some online businesses that might be, you know, just starting out doing, you know, $5,000 a year and up to kind of five to $10 million a year. So that kind of contrast is, is kind of really good fun and gives variety. Um, tell me about job rack. What is it? I know you've mentioned it briefly at the start. Yeah, sure. So JobRack is uh, an online job board and hiring service where what we do is we uh, we are focused 100% on Eastern Europe um, and remote workers. So if you've got a business, um, an online business typically, and you want to hire some really, really great remote workers, then um, you know Eastern Europe is a fantastic place to hire from. So they have a really incredible work ethic, really, really strong education system. So really great for technical roles, especially. So developers, designers, project managers, people like that. Um, and they have a low cost of living out there. So, you know, more affordable. Um, so we often find people, you know, when they're just starting up or they're building their business and they can't maybe afford to hire, you know, locally in the UK or in the USA, um, but they still need some help. Then, you know, they come to Eastern Europe and uh, vast majority of them then stay hiring from Eastern Europe because the quality is tends to often you know, be uh, a lot better than what we can find locally, uh, even even disregarding the price. Mm -hmm. What is it about your leadership style and all that that has allowed you to grow that business and allowed to be successful? Hmm, good question. I think for me, I'm really, really big on just enabling the people that work for me to kind of have autonomy um, and have authority. And just, you know, I do not want to micromanage and I don't micromanage. It's just give people opportunity, focus on kind of results and outcomes, not on tasks. Um, and, you know, encourage them to make mistakes. That's that's really, really key. So that I'm, I'm growing very, very quickly at the moment, which brings its own its own challenges. Uh, I'm almost continuously hiring for job rack myself. Uh, which I'm uniquely placed to do. Obviously, that's kind of our speciality. And um, but yeah, really just giving people that chance to, you know, kind of grow, invest in training and learning for them. Um, I just help guide them on the path and you know, let them do great things. And like I said, making sure that they can, they feel safe to make some mistakes along the way, because because that's how we learn. Mm -hmm. You mentioned a couple of words there, like enable, give them autonomy. And I think you, you, you spoke about focusing on results as opposed to focusing on tasks. Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've I recently moved into a leadership position, which is brilliant, right? And that's the type of leader I want to be, right? But it's mm -hmm. it's um, much, much easier said than done. How do you get to that point? Because there's, uh, yeah, it's, it's strange. Hmm. It, it's tough, right? I mean, I've been in leadership roles for, well, the best part of probably like, well, effectively for like kind of 20 years, if not longer now, um, because there's always opportunities to lead, even if you don't have line management for people you know just how you influence with your peers um how do you get to that stage i think for me is be aware that you're always learning um always be kind of asking for feedback and, and just learn from other people so look at people that you know you think look like they're doing it well and emulate them um be aware that lots of people don't do it well and and kind of read and listen to podcasts and you know just consume information so uh, emotional intelligence so eq i think is hugely important um and, and especially just, yeah, you know, when you're talking, it's really, it's pretty easy to, instead of focusing on, you know, you want this particular task done, if you actually take that extra minute with one of your team and talk about the result that you're actually looking for and the outcome and then getting their ideas on how to do it, A, they'll feel massively more engaged and, you know, they're likely to do a much better job uh, as a result. And so just getting into kind of, you know, leadership training courses and, you know, lots of big organizations do it. You do a good job at this, but these days there's so much content there about, you know, being a good um, leader, manager, 
you know, ways to focus on these things, you know, whether you're an audible guy, whether you're a kind of uh, reading things on Kindle, podcasts, blogs, just, um, you know, always be trying to learn. That's, that's the key, I think. Mm -hmm. Um, You also touched upon your unique ability to be able to hire and you're doing that yourself at the moment. What are some tips you'd have for hiring managers? Because it is a challenge um, to get the right person. Yeah, hiring's hard. Hiring is really, really hard. Um, and it never gets easier. Just it doesn't matter how many times you've done it, it never gets easier. The biggest thing that a biggest tip that I can give is really think about what you want and what you need this person to do. I see time and time again in both the corporate world and you know in the kind of online business world, people like jumping into a hire, you know, to start hiring for someone. And they think that, oh, well, that's, you know, someone's just left, so we're just going to replace them. But actually, well, has the business moved on? Has the job moved on? Has the technology moved on? So just taking some time to really think about it and, you know, ignore the HR templates and just think about what's the actual things that they're going to do? What are their outputs going to be? What are they going to produce? And if you start there, then you can wind back into a a job description or a person template, things like that. But just what do you actually want them to do? Uh, And a good question that you can kind of ask yourself, and we often include it in job posts, is if you'd been working for us for the past two weeks, these are some of the things that you might have done. And then you can make it really uh, practical, really relevant, and it's much easier for you as a, you know, a leader or a kind of hiring manager to actually think about what you actually want them to do then that leads through into job description and then into you know selection and into interviews and you can talk about those things and it's actually what they're going to do unlike so often the job description bears no resemblance to the actual job that they're going to do yeah i, I think the, the job description is awfully uh, often over complex and, and complicated and it's made to look a lot more <laughs> complex than it, than it necessarily is tell me um you touched upon it on the start but you've worked so many different roles how did you evolve and move from role to role because as i was speaking to you off air about so many people i would speak to who want to move into leadership positions for example they're told yeah brilliant lovely interview great you have good skills but you don't have the experience how did you move from all those various roles so quickly yeah so i think it comes down to what i said kind of you know about kind of getting Mm -hmm. shit done so I was in uh, kind of project related roles. Um, so a business analyst right in the very start of my career and then into a project manager. And so that you are kind of matrix managing people. So you don't necessarily have line management, but you are leading people. Um, by being the kind of can do person that just, you know, doesn't matter how hard something is, doesn't matter necessarily if it's not my job, but you just get things done. Um, you will typically kind of get offered opportunities. Um, you will never be ready for the opportunities you get offered. And some people will choose to say no to those opportunities um, because they want to be in their comfort zone. Other people will say yes. I think the recognition that you're never really ready to, you know, you always, oh, well, I'd like to wrap this thing up, this project or this role. I'd like to have finished X, Y and Z. You're never really ready. And so if you do get offered opportunity, then, you know, just take it and, and jump no matter how scary it is. If you are not getting offered opportunity, then make sure you're asking for opportunity. So is there, a, is there an opportunity to you know, take online management of some interns or some apprentices, for instance, or of a project team? So can you lead a project and get leadership experience in that way? Which, you know, if someone goes for an interview for a, you know, a role that has got line management, and maybe they haven't had direct reports before, but they have led a project and a project team, the skills are exactly the same. Uh, in fact, in some ways, they're harder because you don't have line management responsibility. So, you know, there's always an opportunity to lead a project, to lead a group of people, something that you can do it in an organization. It just, you know, just got to kind of hunt it out if necessary, express an interest and, you know, be, um, yeah, do, kind of doing the learning to you know justify kind of that you're really interested in it and that, you know, you've got enough to kind of give it a crack. But it's not that hard. It's communication. It's talking to people and just wanting it enough. Okay, so I was looking for those opportunities. Yeah, that very much aligns. You touched on the hiring uh, piece, which you have a huge amount of experience in. I'd be curious to understand, because this is something else that, that I find challenging and other leaders do, but is that virtual onboarding piece and making that um, a, a positive yet seamless experience when, when it's so so not, let's be honest. 
Yeah, definitely. And, and let's be clear, onboarding is hard, right? Mm-hmm. For, and it doesn't matter whether it's in person or not. I mean, most companies screw this up and do a terrible, terrible job. If you were to ask your average new hire at the end of their first day or the end of their first week, you know, out of 10, how do they feel about their new job? Not many are going to give it a 10 um, because most organizations haven't really invested in onboarding and you know, just want people to get started and right, here's the job, get cracking. You know, we're going to give you a bit of an orientation. Not many organizations do it really, really well. Virtually, it brings its own challenges as half the world has discovered over this last 18 months, etc. Um, and it requires more thought. And the most important thing is to be intentional about the time with your new member of staff. Because if you're in an office together, you would naturally have those little moments like when they walk past your desk in the morning, for instance, or maybe you'd grab lunch together, or maybe you'd grab a coffee at 11 in the morning, whatever it might be. Whereas if you're remote, those kind of, um, you know, almost accidental moments, they don't happen. So you have to be intentional about booking time in with them. So, you know, I'm a big fan for the first few weeks. I always advocate, you know, just get time with them every day. Might just be, you know, might be an hour on the first day, might then just be kind of 15 minutes every day from that point on, but just that there is check-ins with them and you just have to be a lot more intentional about it if it's, uh, if it's remote or virtual. Okay. So it's about spending the time with the people essentially to make up for the fact that you're not in an office. Absolutely. You've got to get to know them, right? And only you've got, A, you've got to get to know them as a person because that's how you're going to find out, you know, are they doing well or not? And they've got to kind of get to know you because it's, it's all about trust. It's all about relationships so that you can communicate effectively. And that we, we miss a lot. You know, if you are previously, if you would have been in an office surrounded by, by people, an average company is like a village, right? You go to the baker, right? Not just to buy bread, but they probably all, maybe they sell the newspaper as well, right? And an average business is like that. It's not as clear cut as you go to accounts and you see the accountant or you see the accounts person for something. You go and see, I don't know, Cheryl in accounts because she's the person. And if you were in an office together, you'd be sat next to each people and you'd be like, oh, who do I chat to in HR about this? And someone would tell you. Mm. Whereas it's, and it's really easy to lean across and ask a question. Whereas when we're all remote, it's a bit harder. So it's making sure you kind of signpost people and give people those just kind of that kind of support an opportunity just to ask the casual questions that you know aren't in the onboarding manual or in the in the staff handbook yeah very good i love that um two or three other questions that i'd be interested to to get your thoughts upon you touched on eq emotional intelligence like really big topic that's talked about a lot but for you what is it listening i think that's the big thing for me just like really listening to people um i see a lot of the time people will they think they're listening, they're hearing the words, but they're not actually listening to what the person is really saying and what they're feeling. So listening is the key one for me. Um, and then being able to to act on it. And we're all so busy. Life's fast, right? There's so, always so much work to do. So actually taking that time to listen is um, is really important. So that, that's the number one for me of, of EQ, because if you listen, you can then understand. And if you understand, you can then act accordingly. That's the, the single biggest thing. And then there's tons of interesting stuff written about um, emotional intelligence. And it's that is the thing that will you know really help people to stand out. So, you know, to any of the audience that are, you know, aspiring leaders that want to get into management roles or, you know, are you know, in, you know, just getting into management roles or even if they've been in for years, can't you know, recommend enough, just kind of picking up some EQ content, whether it's blog articles or books and just kind of get an understanding and then just think about, you know, honestly thinking about how uh, kind of emotionally intelligent that you are and how you can kind of um, implement it on a day-to-day basis. Okay, excellent. Um, you're the CEO of Job Like Net right now. What what are some of the challenges you face that maybe are slightly different than some of the challenges you would have faced, let's say, as head of operations? So some of them is the sheer pace um, of what we do. So we're able to move very, very fast because we're a small team and we're we're hugely, hugely agile. And with that brings challenge. Um, There's, you know, we are intentionally scrappy about things. We don't, we don't want to do perfect, right? We're not NASA. We don't need to be. So there's a key thing is making sure I heard this phrase quite recently is making sure we're scrappy, not crappy. Um, And so that we move quickly, but we still, you know, really, really kind of focus and give a great, really great experience. So in terms of kind of the people side of things, it's the fact that we are remote, you know, my team's been building over this last kind of two and a half years. Uh, We should have got face to face together, um, kind of all together for a retreat last year. We didn't manage that because of kind of travel situation around COVID hoping that probably early 2022, that will, that will change. And that's, 
just having to put a lot more effort into really getting to know each other. Um, so that's kind of a key thing and, and not being, you know, my approach as a leader in kind of, you know, the corporate world is to be celebrating success a lot. You know, we have, we used to have a lot of daily standups and huddles and things like that, you know, just celebrating when people have done good things, buying cakes, taking chocolates in that kind of stuff. That is harder uh, to do when we're remote and it's particularly harder when your team's distributed across the world and it's not quite as easy to, you know, send some donuts or send some beer to them. Yeah, yeah. I, I've been racking my brain about that too when, when they're all over Europe. How, how do you figure that out? Because it is so easy when you're all in one location. Yeah. Here in the in the UK, what I found to be really great is like Deliveroo, right? That is brilliant because you can order Deliveroo even if you're not in the area. So I've had a few surprise packages kind of arrive and you, know, you have to explain to the delivery driver that they're not going to expect it. They're going to think you're at the wrong house. So Deliveroo is great. Uh, Amazon is also good for like Western Europe. But as soon as you get into places like where my team are in kind of Bosnia and Herzegovina, Serbia, Macedonia, there is not Amazon and Deliveroo for us to be able to uh, to be able to lean on. So what we tend to do is actually get some members of the team that kind of, you know, I've got a few members of the team that live quite close by, you know, we'll get each of them to help out with the other, uh, which kind of makes it quite good fun. Nice. Too. Yeah, very good. Uh, excellent. No. So last question for me today, and I'll let you get on your way. And I'm really very grateful for the time that you've given me this evening. I know mm-hmm. you're a busy man, but how do you see leadership evolving over the coming years? I'd like to say what I want to say is that I want to see it improve dramatically. Um, I think we will we'll get better at doing it remotely. Um, I think emotional intelligence will, will continue to uh, increase in its importance. And I think it, there's going to be a bit of a different skill set around it, you know, with it being virtual, with us having hybrid teams, et cetera. Um, and uh, just people just kind of grasp an opportunity. So I think, you know, we're, everything is always changing, right? There's things are never constant. We are seeing some very rapid change right now, though. Uh, and that's going to bring some really, really great opportunities. So uh, I think just more opportunity, more focus on it. And, and it's going to be different because it's going to be less about your ability to, you know, lead a team of people in an office and more about the ability to, you know, do it in a hybrid way. And, you know, like I said, when I mentioned matrix management, so leading from within a team, that is going to be more and more commonplace as, you know, we need less big kind of corporate hierarchies and structures, in, in my opinion. I think that matrix, man- matrix management is even more powerful if an individual within a team can lead and allow the leader to, to focus on more strategic stuff because they have more influence over their peers. Do you think, lastly, because you've touched on it and I'm, I'm curious, do you think things will continue to move at the same rapid pace of change or do you think things will go back to normal very quickly once we settle down? No chance it's going back to normal. And, and I mean, I'm quite an opinionated guy. So when I see people saying, yeah, it's going back to normal, everyone's coming back in the office, they are in cuckoo land. The job market right now is so buoyant. The opportunities are huge. So if you're the CEO of a big business, big corporate business, and you're about to try and tell it all you're going to tell all your staff to come back in the office five days a week or even three days a week you are going to lose a lot of people people are very very likely to go i don't want to do that commute and actually it would be different if there was a real justification for it and there was a real reason that they should because they worked better we've all just survived the last 18 months and actually a lot of businesses have done really well so there's i'm a big big fan of being co-located being in the office for certain tasks. If you're doing a workshop and you all want to get around a, a whiteboard with a thousand post-it notes, that is not, well, that's not easy when you try and do that remotely. That's hard. But actually, if you're just kind of grinding away, getting stuff done, then, you know, we can be remote. So I think hybrid's definitely the way. Uh, it's going to take some getting used to. And I think some companies are going to go through a tough time because I think they're going to take the hard approach to it, try and force people back in the office. And we will see, you know, people will kind of vote with their feet and they go, I can travel into the central London or center of the city five days a week for this existing job, or I can get paid more to do a job with a different company with potentially greater opportunity and more flexibility. And it will equalize in time, but yeah, it's going to be an interesting and rocky road while people kind of figure out what they want. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of people right now saying that they want to go back in the office and um, they're really keen to go back in the office. And I think what will happen is people will go back in and go, Actually, this is not as great as I remembered it. <laughs> it will be the yeah. grass is the grass is always greener, right? They, so you know, I think we'll then find this happy medium of uh, you know, for, for some businesses they've got to have people in the office. Other businesses, it will be you know, hybrid's going to be the way forwards. I don't necessarily think people right now are missing the office. I think it's the freedom of choice, you know, to be able to say I want to yeah. work two days or three days. But 
just lastly, so before let's go, what are your thoughts though on the pressure that might come on governments from, let's say, investors in real estate, businesses mm-hmm. around offices, et cetera, that might force them to encourage people to go back to work? So I think, I mean, we've been seeing this in the high street, right? For the last, what, eight to 10 years, right? The high streets have been dying and still and really, really struggling. And that was before COVID. Um, you could argue that kind of residential, uh, sorry, commercial landlords are about to go through the same thing. Uh, if you look at Canary Wharf, which is where I live in, in London, there's a big push right now. There's some great articles in the press about how a, it, what a great place to live it is, whereas previously people have just thought about it as a center for offices and banking and investment bankers, whereas actually it's a fantastic place to live. And so, you know, I could absolutely see, you know, more space get converted into kind of co-work spaces for the people that, that kind of live here and want to work locally. So I think there's still tons of opportunity. It's just going to take some time to, to shake it out. But I think the ability for governments and big industry to kind of force people back to how it was in 2019, that, that kind of boat has sailed. Um, so it's just about us all figuring out that, you know, what works for each company and opportunity will come as a result. Lovely. Yeah, I agree. And I hope that's the way it is. I hope that's the way it is. As I said mm. to you this week, I'm down the west of Ireland visiting my parents, being able to work from home. It's great to have that flexibility. Um, so if people want to reach out to you, Noel, or get in touch or work with you, how might they do that? Yeah, just head to connect with Noel. So that's N-O-E-L. So connect with Noel.com. Uh, all my details there. And always, yeah, feel free to get in touch. Brilliant. Come on, Noel. Thanks, Milton. No worries, Colin. All right. Super stuff there from Noel. I, I thoroughly enjoyed the chat and uh, I hope you guys did too. So I'm going to actually be on annual leave for the next two weeks. So there'll be no podcast for the for the next two weeks. So we'll be back again around the 15th or 16th of August with our next episode. And until then, have a, have a, enjoy the, the uh, next couple of weeks and chat to you soon.